Artificial intelligence is no longer the stuff of science fiction. It's having an impact on dentistry from improving the accuracy of diagnosis to spotting waste, fraud, and even abuse in dental insurance claims. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Morda Inam and Dr. Robert Fayela, the CEO and Chief Dental Officer of Overjet, respectively, about how the technology is impacting the way dentists practice. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Richard. For Our pleasure. Us. Okay, well, just to begin, um, could you provide a brief definition of artificial intelligence and what applications it could have in dentistry? So artificial intelligence is basically the ability uh, or intelligence shown by machines. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the artificial comes in. Uh, but, you know, people like to call it by different names now. Even augmented intelligence is something that people are trying to use. But the idea is that machines uh, demonstrating the intelligence that humans have and trying to mimic the intelligence that humans have. Uh, and when it comes to dentistry itself, uh, we are seeing applications currently in, in first clinical applications, which is utilizing uh, the clinical data, which is the x-rays or the period charts that might be present in, the, uh, in a dental practice and being able to support the dentist in better diagnosis. But we're also seeing administrative um, uh, applications as well, whether it is when you're scheduling patients or uh, better responding to uh, them uh, via bots on your websites. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be administrative applications as well as clinical applications. And right now, uh, it's a great time in dentistry because we're seeing uh, applications on board. Okay. And um, Dr. Fayella, can you tell us how artificial intelligence can make those diagnostic claims? Well, here's the interesting part about this, Richard. So, you know, when you have a when you have a patient come into your practice, you, we gather a lot of data points all year long on all of our patients, and we use them when the patients are with us at the point of care. Mm -hmm. But we rarely take a look at those, you know, in between appointments until they're back in our offices again. Mm -hmm. To look at things at scale, where we're collecting a lot of data, but are we utilizing it to its maximal maximal ability? So, I think it's the time right now where we have to really re-examine our assumptions about how technology can enhance our cognition, how it can enhance our ability to use that data in a meaningful way. So for example, when somebody comes into your practice, you have a list of daily patients, you may actually look at those patients and you'll have to take a look at each chart as patients come through one at a time. Mm -hmm. But if you could see those patients in advance, have a, an algorithm that can identify certain, certain indications, for example, either carries or percent DMF uh, for a crown indication, or scaling and root planing percent bone loss or millimeter bone loss in the posterior on bite wings. If you can see that in advance and you know that the patient is coming in for routine cleanings, and in fact now has an indication for let's say scaling and root planing, um, you can actually look at that and have a, a meaningful conversation with them and use that annotated image to inform both you know, the dentist as well as to educate the patient in what their needs may be. And it just makes sure that it brings you another level of, uh, of gathering information for your patients for the best information and the right treatment at the right time. So basically the artificial intelligence, the software can look at the same radiographs and images that the dentists are looking at and spot the same issues like caries and other things. Exactly, and, and when you see that sometimes in a busy day, it's very difficult sometimes to actually point out very early changes. For example, early changes in carious lesions on the proximal surface that may not be all the way to the enamel dental junk, dental dentin junction. Mm -hmm. The DEJ is a very, a very critical point where once that crosses in, as you know, it's a restorative indication. So remineralization may be possible if you can catch it early enough. Mm -hmm. And if we can use the ability for machines to identify a very sensitive early uh, detection, then that will inform you and you can best either watch or inform the patient about the best course of treatment. Okay, and have there been any studies comparing AI's performance against human performance to see which diagnosis is better than the other? So there have been studies conducted uh, in the past, uh, but I wouldn't say AI is better than humans. I think AI works uh, or aug augments uh, or enhances human decisions. So in the end, we believe that Dentists uh, have to make the final decision. Uh, think of it as a hygienist who's highlighting things to a dentist, and in the end, it's the dentist's decision. Because 
you know, x-rays tell you one story. There's more information that the dentist is seeing, whether it is uh, clinically or whether there might be other information that they're taking into account. So at this time, you know, in just pure diagnosis, yes, when you go into, you know, de uh, uh, detection of disease, mm -hmm. machines can perform as well as or even better than human, given that the, the limited information that they're being, uh, they're getting, but but humans can do a lot uh, in terms of understanding the context, understanding or identifying what the patient really wants for, or what, what, what you know, do they want to be more aggressive on their treatment or want to, uh, or feel more comfortable uh, uh, waiting uh, and being able to make the right decisions for them. And I think that's what uh, dentists do best uh, and providing that care to the patient and having that patient experience uh, uh, through the dentist rather than through uh, just computers. So the human element is still the most important thing and uh, what, what, provide, what ensures the quality of the care both for the dentist and for the patient. Absolutely. Okay, um, but dentists, especially maybe um, older dentists who are more trained in more analog technologies, um, how do you reassure them that this new tool, and it's really just a tool, how do you reassure them that this tool is something that can augment the quality of their care? Well, I think the, the, the most important thing is that they use it and visualize it as a tool. This is something that can actually enhance their ability to identify certain things for their clinical acumen to be able to verify because it's it, their verification, their clinical acumen is an application. And so if the algorithm can help gather information and it's almost like somebody clerking for you as a judge, they bring all of the information of the case to you mm -hmm. and you're looking at this and now you look at it in the aggregate, you examine the patient, you have that conversation, and you put it into context with a recommendation for treatment. And there may be two or three ways to approach it. But once you have that information, now you can explain to the patient in real terms how the, the course of treatment they should take. And they, they're better informed about it. That's a great example, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And um, where does the technology stand now? Is it already rolling out to dental practices? Are we still just in the research stage? Yeah, so it's still early stages in terms of, uh, so we are um, in practices through the IRB, so Investigational Review Board protocols that are being met to be in the practices. Uh, you know, we, we are going through an FDA approval. Uh, however, there are a lot of other applications, not just when it impacts patient care, but all the other applications that are being utilized uh, especially by larger or group practices where they're looking at their practices and seeing how many patients uh, in their practices uh, might, not, uh, might not have been treated that should have been treated or the other way around and being able to view their practices um, uh, or, or many practices in, that, that they might have. Those applications are happening currently at, at scale uh, and then the actual application of uh, informing uh, patient care that is uh, that, that is being uh, go, is going through clinical studies in these practices. Okay, and can you share maybe some of the results of those early experiences? Are you seeing positive feedback from dentists, positive feedback from patients uh, on how they've been using the technology so far? Yeah, so from our side, it's, it's been amazing. Honestly speaking, I think dentists are amazed uh, by how much uh, uh, you know, even the ones that that see our demos and they see what what this can provide, but when they actually utilize it in their practices, they're amazed of how much uh, things are fall just falling through the cracks that they might not have realized, even whether it's their protocols or whether it has to do something with the the, uh, the care that is being provided. But uh, the value being added into this practice is enormous, probably higher than we actually thought when we started this. Uh, uh, the company, but uh, so far, um, uh, you know, I think this is a very valuable tool that uh, dentists are, whoever it has uh, piloted it, has gone on to uh, continue utilizing it so far. Okay, and um, on top of the, uh, the clinical applications, you're referencing the administrative applications too. Can you just walk us through what some of those applications are, whether it's, again, scheduling, insurance forms, marketing, and other tools? Yeah. Well, I think. Yeah. Well, please go ahead. So, so for example, some of the just in terms of even practice metrics and the ability to follow your practice goals. You know, you could look at different KPIs, and some of these are available in other applications as well. But if you can have AI look at scale across your practice, and they look at the radiographs that are there, and maybe identify 
certain numbers of patients, certain patients that are present that have an indication for scaling root planning because mm -hmm. they have bone loss beyond a certain metric that you configure. You can say, maybe you look back and you see that they've been coming in for routine prophylaxis, but there's an indication for a more definitive treatment for them. They're losing some bone and you can catch it at an earlier phase. That's one way for them to look, to translate things that are in the practice through the ability to identify at scale and then you know, have that conversation with the patient or have them into, to put them into treatment that they need. We're really not telling them what they should do. And we're not telling them, you know, this is something that we're trying to move them into because you know, we feel it would be a productivity thing. It's not that. It's more about getting the patient to understand the treatment that they actually need and just giving them the opportunity to make a good decision with, with reason. And that's, and that's one application. And I'm sure Warda has uh, others. And just to add to that, in terms of the uh, administrative uh, side of things, one is uh, uh, wrong coding, so uh, undercoding of procedures. People think about all this upcoding, but there's also procedures that are being coded incorrectly that we find by looking at what was actually done and uh, uh, and what what was coded. Whether um, and a lot has to do with the administrative staff or the office manager uh, in the, in this case. Uh, and uh, to add to that is even scheduling, being able to not only identify that the disease uh, might have been missed, but being able to schedule those patients as well, more from the administrative side of things. Uh, and in general, then looking at, uh, uh, so recall becomes a, bi a big uh, piece of it. Uh, and, so, uh, and then we are seeing you know, uh, other applications, uh, which is uh, better appointments being set up by uh, ident uh, by analyzing the calls, et cetera, that, that are happening uh, to the patients uh, uh, or the patients are, are calling in and, and staying. So uh, a lot, a lot uh, that's going to change in these practices and a lot of uh, efficiency for the uh, practice owners as well. So the artificial intelligence can actually comb through um, patient records and maybe spot who needs to come in for more than just a checkup or a cleaning. It, it could see, wait a second, there's indications of a larger problem here that um, the clinicians may have missed the first time around. Or even as, as uh, Dr. Renan mentioned, we, you know, patient would come in for a hygiene routine prophylaxis, let's say. Mm -hmm. Patient comes in, a lot of inflammation, a lot of edema, maybe a lot of calculus and bleeding. The hygienist looks and says, well, I only have 45 minutes or an hour for this appointment. I don't think I'm going to be able to get this done. I think we need scaling and replanning. They'll call the doctor in, the doctor will examine. They'll say, oh, yep, it looks like this is a little bit more than a prophylaxis. Let's submit for scaling and replanning. Mm -hmm. Well, all the calculus may be on enamel rather than on root surface. Maybe the bone loss is not there, but the edema has caused some pseudo-pocketing. So you're really miscoding that, and then it comes back with a denial. The patient's upset. They're not being benefited for what they think they need. Uh, the doctor then has to send in an appeal. It takes time. It, it, this way, there's, there are other codes that they could have applied if they had recognized that earlier. So they say all the enamel is on, uh, all the mm -hmm. calculus is on enamel. And they could put four, three, four, six per se, scaling in the presence of inflammation. So those are the kinds of things where you can actually apply the right code at the right time. Okay, so the artificial intelligence is not only helping with the, the treatment planning and even case acceptance in the communication with the patient, but also it's um, improving um, claims approvals and applications? Well, I think what it's doing is it's, it's aligning you with, with, the, with the right code for the right treatment if you can mm -hmm. identify the indications first. And all the insurance companies publish their criteria, so you should have that conversation with the insurance companies you work with. Mm -hmm. and they will give you some of the criteria that they follow. And you can look at those yourself if you have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. And here to add to that, we're also working with some uh, DSOs uh, and some insurance companies to enable point of care adjudication. So being able to, uh, while the patient is in the chair, being able to submit that claim uh, for a particular procedure, say if, if it's a crown, and being getting the approval uh, prior to even the procedure has happened uh, and while the patient has left uh, 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 the office and being able to convey to the patient that this treatment will be covered so that they feel more comfortable in accepting the treatment and actually getting the treatment done. So it actually, it, it can accelerate the process as well to get treatment um, approved faster, get the patient under care sooner. 
Exactly. So it's going to be a game changer for the patient experience, uh, whether it is understanding their disease uh, more effectively such that they can make the right informed decision or uh, having an ability to uh, get, get their claims adjudicated faster such that they can, when, while they're making the decision, they also know the financial burden that they're going to uh, face or not face in, in this case, if you know, it, it's going to be covered. And that way they're, they're more comfortable and more informed of, and can make the decision uh, that helps improve their care. Okay, and also we keep referring to the insurance companies. Um, are they taking advantage of the technology on their end in the claims approval process? So definitely the insurance companies are uh, do see the value here in terms of uh, streamlining some of these processes on their end, which is, you know, being able to uh, uh, review the claims faster, more accurately, uh, and make the decisions uh, in a way that it is uh, um, meets the, their own criteria uh, for the utilization review. So uh, definitely an opportunity now for payers and, uh, or insurance companies and uh, dentists to be on the same page when it comes to what are the guidelines uh, for the particular treatment and what, 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 what will be the criteria that are going to be utilized in making the decision from the insurance side such that they are uh, making the right decision for the patient uh, and uh, ensuring that the right care is getting delivered as well. Okay, and also, um, although it surely affects you know, a small percentage of actual practicing den dentists, there are some bad apples out there. And we've been seeing cases of how artificial intelligence is being used to spot uh, waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, have you had any experience in those areas with the software? Well, yes, we have. And, and in point of fact, what the good, the good news about it is that there's not much of it. I mean, there's a very, very low percentage, but the ones that tend to do it tend to do it more than one or two times. And so it can be an impactful thing for, um, for the patients and for the insurance companies that are benefiting these, these, um, these fraudulent uh, uh, applications. And it, it's really kind of a very interesting a dilemma because what happens is there there are and water can speak to this in much much more detail but you know they can flip it they can change it they can crop it and sometimes we're even seeing phantom disease and phantom treatments and it's it's very little but it's really amazing the sophistication to which people are doing it and the way i look at it is that it's it's somewhat of a self-limiting problem because with the ability for forensic uh, applications, especially in digital radiography, um, mm -hmm. it's it's becoming much easier, almost like an FBI level, uh, mm -hmm. you know, approach to it, where it can be very, very specifically identified, and it'll be self-limiting once it's known that this these techniques can be identified. Okay, and it seems that there's such a broad range of applications, again, from the administration to the scheduling to the diagnostic. Um, what kind of, can you tell us a little bit about the company itself and what expertise it brings to these different areas? Yeah, so Overjet uh, started about three years ago, uh, basically uh, uh, coming from my experience where I, uh, I, I changed my dentist and after receiving a treatment plan, which was different than my previous dentist, it got me uh, uh, interested in the complexities of, a, uh, of dental diagnosis and what was all needed and started looking deeper into it uh, and decided that this is something that uh, was definitely worth pursuing because it, it impacts every human being in the world. Uh, so uh, uh, we got together, got you know, uh, both dental and technical expertise on board, and now we've gone on to recruit some of the leading machine learning experts as well as uh, dental industry professionals such as uh, uh, Dr. Fayala here as well who, who are here like shaping how dentistry um, utilizes artificial intelligence in the best way possible and how do we work with all the stakeholders uh, and, and make sure that we are solving their problems uh, and uh, at Overjet, our core has been computer vision, but that's not all we do. We do a lot of data science and, uh, and other and natural language processing, et cetera, as well. But when I say computer vision, that is the ability to read x-rays uh, and, uh, and identify findings uh, similar to a dentist uh, 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 or how a dentist would look at the x-ray, but also look at the notes, et cetera, that might be present uh, to help uh, dentists make better decisions. Uh, whether on the insurance side or, or on the practice side. 
Okay, and also, uh, Dr. Anand, can you tell us a little bit about your own background in, in um, artificial intelligence and, and software and computer science um, for you to make that jump from uh, those studies to that visit to the dentist that provoked you to think about artificial intelligence and its applications there? So uh, before this, uh, I was working in a biomedical imaging startup doing MRI data, uh, and uh, which was uh, focused on making that more quantitative and, and faster uh, to acquire. And previous to that, I was at MIT in the computer science and artificial intelligence lab working on artificial intelligence uh, on biomedical uh, sensing, so using wireless signals to detect breathing heart rate automatically. So ha ha have... Uh, um, both uh, backgrounds in computer vision, artificial intelligence, but in general in healthcare as well. Uh, and it all kind of came together, but it is not just me. We have a huge team behind us who are probably the biggest experts, whether it's vision or, or, or uh, dentistry. And I think now I've come to a point that they're kind of leading the, uh, these efforts. Uh, and, uh, and we were fortunate enough to, be, to have a great team working on such an important problem. Okay, and Dr. Fayella, how did you come on board to uh, Overjet at, with your experience as, as a, a wet fingers dentist to get into all this technology? Well, actually, uh, so I did after I went through the ADA and uh, I've been practicing and, and had a career that's been, uh, I, I think, very, very rewarding, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I did my MBA at MIT and mm -hmm. uh, Eduarda and uh, Dr. Anam and uh, Dr. Rama, uh, Rama, uh, so Deepak, our chief technology officer, they both went to MIT. They're computer science PhDs, brilliant. And they, uh, when they, when Warda started the company as a founder, you know, we actually touched base initially through the alumni network, and uh, didn't necessarily connect at that time. But uh, then followed up about a year ago, and uh, and so it's been, you know, this. I think this is the most exciting technology that's coming through, and I'm saying that. Um, from prior experience, prior to even becoming involved with Overjet, not, not because I'm with the company, it's because that's why I am with the company. It's because I think it's a transformative technology. And knowing how, trans how uh, translational these technologies can be, I'm, I'm convinced that this will not go backwards for the profession. Once people start utilizing this in the proper way to enhance their cognition and be able to find the right treatment at the right time for patients, uh, I don't think they'll ever go back to looking at it in the former way. So I'm pretty excited about the future for this, as we okay. all are. And looking ahead to that future, uh, the technology already seems so capable. What's next for it? What um, predictions do you have for other applications or just refining the applications it currently has? So just uh, in the near future, we're working on is progression of disease. So how does disease progress over time uh, when, and being able to measure that, whether it is progression of uh, carious lesions or it is actually uh, bone, bone levels and being able to measure that accurately so that we can start looking at how fast that's progressing, what should be the right uh, protocols in terms of the treatment. Uh, and then in the, in the uh, longer term, we're looking at medical and dental integration. How do you look at whether it's screening of disease in the dental practices or the connection between di uh, diabetes and periodontal disease or other chronic conditions as well? Uh, and uh, we have research going on with Harvard and other uh, uh, institutes as well, or academic institutions where we're studying these phenomena and, and uh, being able to uh, quantify them and, and uh, determine some of the conditions that might, we might be able to predict. Uh, so it's, it's a very exciting time, I think, in dentistry uh, for us and being able to now move towards the evidence-based dentistry uh, and uh, be able to start uh, measuring uh, disease and progression of disease is something that we're very excited about. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple of more points then. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add that perhaps we haven't covered uh, so far today? Although it seems we've had a very comprehensive discussion of the topic so far today. Well, I think, you know, clearly there'll be, a, this will evolve. I mean, obviously uh, the applications will evolve as people become more familiar with what it has to offer. And as we develop more and more of the uh, ideas that we have in the pipeline right now, those are the things that will actually grow this, uh, this technology across the profession. And people will use it in ways they can't imagine today. I think that you know, one of the most exciting pieces about this is the, the ability to uh, actually stratify risk in your practice and be able to follow the outcomes, as Dr. Anand mentioned, uh, at, over time. 
So if you have somebody with a non-communicable disease like diabetes or cardiovascular disease, you know, those patients who have periodontitis, one of the global, you know, most significant global uh, non-communicable diseases orally, they have common factors that they, they share. And those factors, you know, it bring, brings risk to patients that you can follow and maybe enhance their treatment frequency or interventions at an earlier point if you see that they're not being maintained. So the ability to follow that, to stratify that risk and provide better care for patients in their entire health picture, I think that's the best way to, to look at the future for AI. Okay, and one last thing then. Um, the technology, again, is so new and people are just learning about it for the first time. Uh, where can they go for more information and more resources just to find out about the technology and see how they could possibly adapt it and bring it into their own practices? So one good place would be our website, overjet, www.overjet.ai. Another thing we're doing is we're working on articles with uh, which have a broader reach, whether it is compendium, we're curating an AI series uh, uh, on the different topics uh, which uh, are going to impact uh, uh, dentists uh, in, in uh, solo practices or DSOs or pairs, etc. There's also other work going on that we can talk probably more about uh, or Bob could talk a more about. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, so one would be just follow us. Uh, there, there's a lot happening, probably follow you guys as well as you, you guys have an AI uh, um, uh, series as well that, that is uh, underway. Uh, but in general, getting involved, I would say, you know, we, dentists are the most important piece of this technology. This is not a technology that technologists are just making and they're going to, uh, and uh, uh, dentists are going to utilize we're actually encoding dentist's understanding of disease into models. And that is, dentists are inputting what actually comes out as an output to us. So it's extremely important that dentists become part of this uh, transformation that's happening. So emailing us at info at overjet.ai might be a good way as well. Probably you can provide them some links to do, to do so, but getting involved in this phenomena so that we can all ensure that the right care is getting delivered uh, to the patients uh, and uh, the patients are benefiting for, for from the use of this technology. Okay. And I, sh I should mention, I should mention one other thing. The schools are starting to look at this for engagement in their radiology curricula. So um, it, right now, as I mentioned, the students right now expect technology will drive their practices uh, going into uh, early career and mid career and on. So we're starting to receive a lot of inquiries from the schools about how do we engage this, how do we engage our students in this technology. So it'll, it'll be coming forward very significantly in the next few months. Great. Well, thank you for sharing um, your insight and perspectives with us today. Again, it's an area that we know our readers are very interested in and they just need and want to find out more about it. So thank you for your time today and uh, we hope to hear from you again soon. Thank, thank you, Richard. Richard. Thank you for Have a good day. Thanks.